This is the Church of Scientology, and it is the most cultish church I have snuck into to date. From their belief of no hell, to their belief of no sin, to their belief that there's no such thing as real sickness. Today, we're going to break down everything that they believe in the conversations that I had while attending the church, being one of the only four members that was there. So let's get into it. Yeah, so we don't believe in original sin, like many other um, thought models <laughs> and religions out there. Um... The Church of Science, a movement that claims to offer spiritual healing, enlightenment, and a way to control one's destiny. But as a Christian, I believe it is vital that we compare these claims with the truth found in the Word of God. Today, we'll explore the origins and teachings of the Church of Science, why its beliefs contradict the biblical Christianity worldview we have, and how we can respond by pointing people to the truth found in God's Word. The Church of Science traces its roots back to the 19th century, specifically to a woman named Mary Baker Eddy, who is accredited as the founder. Eddy was born in 1821 in Bow, New Hampshire, and she experienced a life marked by illness and struggle. As she sought healing from her ailments, she turned to various alternative forms of medicine, including a teaching of a healer named Quimby. Quimby's ideas rooted in the new thought philosophy, emphasizing the power of the mind to heal the body, something that profoundly influenced Eddie. In 1866, after several injuries from slipping on ice, Eddie claimed to have had a spiritual revelation while reading the Jesus' healing miracles in the Bible. She believed that the divine truth she discovered had healed her, and this experience had led her to develop her own theological framework. Unfortunately, we know as Christians that this is simply just not what we see in scripture when it comes to how to come to theological conclusions. We don't get to use our personal heart to define what scripture says. We don't get to come up with our new theology just because we happen to disagree or are searching for something that we're not being able to find in scripture already. We find truth already in the word of God and then from there make our truth claims about the life that we're going to live. In 1875, Eddie published her seminal book, Science and Health, The Key to the Scriptures, which later became the text found as the Christian Science Textbook. Despite its name, Christian Science is not aligned with biblical Christianity. In her textbook, Eddie claimed that sickness, sin, and death are illusions and can be overcome by understanding the divine nature of of reality. She taught that people could heal themselves through prayer and aligning their thoughts with the divine truth. The problem is today the Church of Science believes that this textbook is on the exact same playing field as the Bible itself. And they wouldn't tell you this if you asked them this question, but from me having conversations with them and attending myself, I have a pamphlet right here in my hand that says very clearly that they believe that this is equal with the Word of God. Eddie's teachings quickly gained followers, and in 1879, she found the Church of Christ Scientists, commonly known as the Church of Science. Her movement spread rapidly, appealing to those seeking healing and a sense of control over their life. But as we'll soon see, the teachings of Mary Baker Eddy and the Church of Science are not in line with the teachings of the Bible. The Church of Science's core beliefs diverge sharply from Christianity in several crucial areas. The first is their view of God. It's fundamentally different than the biblical understanding. According to Eddie's teachings, God is not a personal being, but an impersonal principle referred to as the divine mind or the infinite love. This conception of God reduces him to an abstract impersonal force, to energy, or even just thought. And the beauty about this from their worldview is they get to justify living in all sorts of sins because at the end of the day, they can push off any of the sins that they want as simply a mortal challenge, but it's not even real in their mind because sin is not real because sin is mortal. But we see, ironically, this contradicts explicitly with Matthew chapter five, where Jesus says, you've heard it of prophets of old, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. The importance of this is that Eddie does not say that something like this would be relevant because Eddie says that sin is mortal, but thought crimes are not mortal. You having lust in your heart, you having hatred for your brother, this is not an action. This is simply something that's happening in the quote unquote spirit realm or the mind. And this would be a perfect example of a sin that Eddie would still have to confront in some way or another. But when you just call God the infinite love, when you just say that sin is not real, then you can justify getting away with any sins that you want to without having to have any sort of moral accountability, even if it's from the text of scripture, because they have another book they get to go to similar to how Mormons do. But the Bible presents a very different picture of God. In Exodus 3.14, God reveals himself to Moses as I am who I am, showing that he is personal, self-existent, and involves his creation. 
In Isaiah 45, 5, he also says, I am the Lord and there is no other beside me. There is no God. God is not an impersonal force, but a relational sovereign creator who desires a personal relationship with us. And he indwells us as believers through his Holy Spirit. He, Jesus said when he was about to leave, he said, I am not going to leave you as orphans, but I'm going to bring another, a helper who's going to be there with you. And don't even worry what to say in times of need, Matthew 10, because I will give you the words to say. We have a God that didn't only want to create us, but then wanted to die for us and then wanted to live inside of us, which is such contradictions from their beliefs. How about the Church of Science's view on Jesus? In Eddie's theology, Jesus is not a unique divine son of God who saves humanity from sin. Instead, Jesus is seen as a great teacher and a demonstration of how to align with the divine mind and overcome the illusion of suffering and death. To them, the crucifixion was not an atonement for sin, but an example of overcoming physical suffering and having a spiritual understanding of it. They will use scriptures like, by his stripes we are healed, to justify why they should be healed all the time of their physical ailments. And to be very clear, they believe this up until the point where they would say, I don't even have pain in my body anyways. This is just a figment of my imagination. And they condemn and reject any amount of you going to a doctor for any sort of medical attention. Instead, they'd say you need to go to one of our spiritual nurses who are going to heal you of your ailment, which is a fancy way of them saying, get prayer for it. So if you have cancer, get prayer for it. And as we're about to see at the end of Eddie's life, she unfortunately went and did not believe her own theology good enough, I guess, because she unfortunately passed away from an ailment herself. The Bible is clear about who Jesus is. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is not just a mortal teacher, but he is the son of God, fully divine and fully human, who came to die for the sins of the world and for the salvations of the world. Jesus in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and nothing came into being that did not come into being but by him. The concept of salvation in the church of science is also deeply flawed. Rather than acknowledging humanity's sinful condition, which is the bedrock of understanding the gospel itself, says that sin is just this figment of our imagination again, something that we cannot address directly in somebody's life. But Jesus Jesus came for sinners, right? Romans 3, 23, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Salvation is an illusion and sin is not just a figment of our imagination, but sin is a real thing that will kill us if we do not turn to Jesus for help. Jesus lived the life that we morally failed to live. This is why he came. He lived the life that we could not live. He died the death that we deserve to die because of our moral failures. And he rose again, defeating death, hell, and the grave, so that if we would put our faith in him, we could be saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith, not of your own works, lest any man should boast, but it is a free gift of God unto salvation. The entire point of Jesus' life was to save us also to model how to live, but to save us from this sin that the Church of Science rejects. One of the most attractive but dangerous aspects of the Church of Science's teachings is the emphasis of mind over matter. Eddie taught that by changing our thoughts, we can change our reality. This is an idea that is a key tenet of her belief system, where sickness and suffering are viewed as an illusion that can be overcome through right thinking. I am sorry, friends, but if you have the flu, you haven't thought the flu into existence. You have the flu because of actual scientific common sense things that have shown the flu in your body. And that's okay. And God could supernaturally hear you. He could also tell you to go to a doctor. He could also just say, hey, you're going to find this one out because your body works well on its own. But to say that everything is just mind over matter and think different and it'll be different is a total lie from hell. While it's true that our thoughts can influence our attitudes and decisions, the Bible reminds us that we are not that we are not sovereign over the universe. God is. Isaiah 55, eight through nine, Jesus says, my, God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are from the earth are my ways and thoughts from yours. We cannot bend reality into our will or name it and claim it and blab it and grab it and speak the world into existence. The scriptures make very clear in James that we have power in the tongue and that our words can kill or destroy or they can bring life. But to think that you can just create or stop sickness in your life simply by speaking it there is 
false. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that God can work and heal today. James 5 tells us that if there is a sick man, bring him in front of the elders and that he can be healed by the prayer of a righteous man. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14, the gifts of the spirit aligned as well as in Romans 12, that there is healing, that God works in miraculous ways and that we can see a transformation in somebody's body and their heart and also most importantly in their salvation. But that is not to say that anytime that we get to say anything, that we're these little gods that get to just tell God what's going to happen with our life. And he's just got to bend his knee to our every want, will, hope, and desire. In addition to these theological errors, the Church of Science also exhibits several cult-like characteristics. Mary Baker Eddy herself was seen as a figure of eminent authority within the movement. And her writings, especially the science and health with the key of scriptures, are considered just as authoritative, if not more, than the Bible itself. This over-reliance on a single leader's interpretation of scripture is a hallmark of many cults. And when I was there, I personally experienced this myself. They read absolutely nothing outside of their book and a few passages in scripture, but no words are said from a preacher anywhere. It's only read from the textbook itself as any sort of commentary. This leads us to the greatest danger of the Church of Science movement spiritual deception. The Bible warns repeatedly against false teachings and the sound appealing towards people following the actual truth. First Timothy 4.1 says, the spirit clearly says that in the latter days, people will abandon the faith and fellows deceiving spirits and these things that are taught by demons. We see also in Timothy, Paul is warning Timothy that this church plant that he has there needs to not have people who are tickling ears. In Galatians 1, it says that if anybody preaches a different gospel than the one that we've preached of sin and salvation from sin, that that person might be a curse, that that person will be anathema. It is vital that us as Christians do not give way to any of these false teachings. Matter of fact, I'll go even further to say the only topic that I see in every single book of the New Testament is a warning of false teaching. I can't tell you that I see the full gospel in every one of the New Testament writings. I can't tell you that I see the topic of love in all of these. Obviously, the, the, the intent or the heart of love is there, but the actual teaching of love is not there. But the teaching of warning of false teachings is in every single one of the New Testament letters that we see. There's a probably really important reason that Paul, James, John, and otherwise made so intentional to talk so frequently about these false teachers. Unlike the fake promises of the Church of Science, Jesus offers real eternal life to those who believe in him. The teachings of the Church of Science may sound appealing for those who especially are in need of physical healing, but they offer a counterfeit spirituality that denies the reality of sin, the need for a savior and the power of the cross. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul warns that there will be people who are coming and believing a different Jesus. They use the same vocabulary as us. The Jehovah's Witnesses do this. The Mormons do this. They'll talk about faith. They'll talk about grace and mercy and love and kindness and righteousness and salvation. They'll use all the same lingo that we use, but they're talking about a counterfeit version of Jesus that is not found in the scriptures. If you're seeking truth, peace, and healing, look no further than the pages of scripture. God's word is alive and it offers a true path to salvation. Hebrews 4, 6 says, My, his, uh, The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide the joint from the marrow and the soul from the spirit, and able to judge the intentions of a man's heart. Eddie Baker ended up dying of a sickness, ironically, showing that she didn't even have the ability to believe in the very words that she was teaching herself, simply because they're false. We should not be following or chasing teachings. We should be following Jesus. And Jesus tells us that we must deny ourselves, pick up our cross daily and follow him. That we have been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. It is not us who lives, but Christ who lives in us. In this life that we now live in the flesh, we live by faith in the son of God who loved us and gave himself up for us. Matthew 5.16, let your light so shine before men so that they might see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. The teachings of challenge, suffering, and intense ridicule for our faith found in the words of scripture are in straight and direct contradiction with the teachings of this church. If you are sick, please go see a doctor. God has graced us with doctors for your healing. If you are somebody who is wanting a right life and right relationship with Jesus, you do not come to him for the things that he can do for you, but because of what he has given you already, which is an opportunity for salvation, a free gift of God that your job is to just grab onto it and take it. One of the things it mentioned was about, okay. about Christian nurses. Can you explain what Christian nurses are? That they can help with like um, dressing wounds and assisting um, and other manners that folks are needing. Uh, they might've had medical assistance and then go to a, medical, uh, a Christian science facility. 
you guys have this this uh, Christian Science textbook, right? Um, so when I'd attended, uh, they'd made clear nobody was going to preach or anything like that. It was just going to be everything was going to be speaking directly from Scripture right. and from the Christian Science textbook. Mm-hmm. So um, do you guys see the Christian Science textbook as uh, authoritative? Well, Mandy Grady um, is the one that discovered and founded it, but we don't worship her, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, we follow her teachings and her manual bylaws, um, but we follow uh, the two textbooks. That's correct. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I, I was understanding that properly. And then, you know, I know that one of the big things is like, you yeah. know, seeing things mortal or, or, you know, seeing things in the physical and how, you know, she rejects that idea of seeing things in the physical. So I'm curious, how does that uh, relate to um, first sin? And then how does that relate to sickness? Because, you know, I come from a, a charismatic background where uh, a lot of people who I'm around, they don't believe that, you know, that you, you shouldn't even speak it into existence or you shouldn't claim that sickness or something like that. So I'm curious on your thoughts of that as well as the the sin side of that. We don't believe in original sin, like many other um, thought models <laughs> and religions out there. Uh, we don't believe in that original sin, uh, you know, that God created us uh, in his image and likeness. So we pull from that part of Genesis um, of creation. Um, so, And that's why we're able to be healed and, and all that, because we're not born to be sinners and we're not born to be ill. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Got it. So to overcome, overcome that, right? Uh-huh. Overcome that, overcome the cross like Jesus did. To yeah. the rest of our ability, right? Right. So we're, like I said, we're each on our own individual path. Some people might be ready to, you know, work out certain things and other people might not. And that's okay because everybody's doing their own thing and learning mm-hmm. and growing at their own time and their own pace. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so in that case, does Christian science believe that, um, that Christians do sin or do you guys reject, I know you don't believe in original sin, but do you believe that we do sin or is that kind of, again, kind of up to every individual? Right. So that's something that like, you know, like say it was, um, centralism or something, that's something that you can pray about and you can overcome if that's something that you're wanting to work on and wanting to overcome in your personal life. So, like, we don't tell people, okay, you should be working on this or that. It's up to each individual to do their prayerful work and, and what they want to work on or uh, overcome in this, you know, human experience that we're in. Right. So as you can see, this is one of the classic one-two steps that every cult does when you press them on a conversation that they don't want to own up to. They unquestionably believe, as we've already discussed, that you are required to go to a healer that is part of their church, a Christian nurse, to be able to get healing. And also one of the ironic things is one of the four people who were in the church, excuse me, two of the four people in the church that day when I went were actually sick. One was in a walker, obviously it's an old age-related thing, and then the other was coughing the entire time. And it was one of the singers, and they were hacking. Like, it wasn't like, uh-uh. <clears throat> I mean, it was like hacking the entire time. Obviously, they haven't gone to a Christian nurse yet or the Christian nurses just don't work. So they're doing this classic one, two step. This is the same thing that Mormons do. If you say, hey, do you remember when Joseph Smith tried to write himself into the book of Genesis? Uh, And then, you know, obviously never got to finish before he got killed. Uh, They'll just one, two step it. They'll be like, that either didn't happen or I don't believe that or I don't think that was actually real. They'll try to do something to skirt past the reality of something that they're denomination for years, decades, centuries sometimes have always chosen to believe. So as you see, again, another classic example where they try to one, two step and say, oh no, well, we believe that the Bible is the word of God. Well, I, my question wasn't if the Bible was the word of God, that was not the question. Um, the question was, if you believe that this Eddie Maker Barry, if this lady's textbook was at equal level with it. And as you see at the very end, she says, yeah, we believe that these are the two textbooks that we should be reading from. Obviously, you take this thing as, as the commentary. Again, this is the same thing that uh, the, the Muslims do or the Jews do with the Bible and the commentary for that or with the uh, Quran and the commentary for that. The Hadith is seen equally as much as scripture for them. They don't define it as scripture, but if you ever ask them any sort of understanding of a specific text, they'll go to the Hadith every single time without fail as if it's infallible. And that's the exact same thing they're doing with the Christian science textbook here. They call it that. It's the only thing they read from on a Sunday morning, even in the church experience that I was part of. It was only the church science textbook as well as the Bible for their view of everything. So they see them both as the word of God, no different than how a Mormon sees the Book of Mormon, Pearls of Great Price, Articles of Faith, and the Bible all as their Christian texts. This one's wild. I never even asked about their view of original sin. I just asked their view of reality of mortal sin. And she actually gave me a way better answer than I was even hoping for. 
she not only said that they don't believe in original sin, which is unbiblical in every way, shape, and form, as you can see all throughout Colossians, Genesis, Romans, like it's it's just objectively fact. But on top of that, she then goes on to even clarify that she doesn't believe in sin really at all. If there's something that you are trying to overcome or you want help with or you feel bad about, then you can go get help for that. But in general, we don't believe overall or at large in this kind of sin. Every sin is personal to you if you even choose to call it sin, but we don't actually claim anything as sin at the end of the day. Again, this could not be further from scripture. Whether you want to nitpick and argue the intricacies or the details of original sin versus, you know, you just chose to sin after birth, whatever. I mean, it's still very wrong, by the way. But like, it's even crazier if you're going to go the extra step to say, oh, we actually don't believe that's in sin at all. I mean, what, what about like all of the times that Jesus says things like you've heard of prophets of old, do not commit adultery, hate is murder. Or when you see the Ten Commandments mentioned in Romans chapter one or Romans chapter two, uh, or when you see in first Corinthians six, nine through 10, where Paul says that you guys were in these sins, but now you've been freed from them. You don't live in them any longer. How about the list that's mentioned in Thessalonians? How about the list that's mentioned? Uh, you, you see my point? Like I can go on and on and on with all the different examples. Like I don't even know how you attempt to argue this point. Uh, what about all the topics of hell or condemnation, right? Uh, uh, life will have their part in the lake of fire revelation 22 like there's no way that you can skirt around these things other than just making up your own theology which when you have an extra textbook to come up with your own theology you can do those things pretty easily actually and i also want to clarify this was not the entirety of the conversation we had a much longer conversation but i only snipped down the parts i thought were most important for us to be able to discuss on this phone call and only keep in the most relevant parts of our answer because i did this with a mormon and we had like a 30 minute discourse and that ended up turning into like an hour long video so to save everybody some time i just cut down the most important points of the conversation we could have gone in a lot of different directions but these are the real core fundamental issues that i and i believe most christians should have with the christian science faith that they have or this false version of faith that they have so again i just want to make clear to everybody i didn't just snip her answers in to make it sound like i wanted them to i just tried to snip all of the kind of redundancy between different topics that we talked about and keep the most important topics in so as you will notice with every one of the videos in our series of churches that we have snuck into that are cults in this way, every one of them started in infancy with something that the original founder did not like about what the Bible said. And instead of us submitting to the word of God and saying, you know what, God, your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And I don't understand, get, or agree with this right now. But I trust that you're God and that I'm not. And I'm going to humble myself under your holy word and live under that they choose to recreate it and flip words around and justify why they're not going to live as the Bible has commanded them to already. Instead, we as Christians have the decision to make every single day just like that, regardless of whether you're a cult leader or not. You have the decision every day of your life to say, God, I don't understand this lust part. God, I don't understand how this hatred is murder in your eyes, but I know that you know better than I do. And instead of me trying to justify my actions, I'm going to submit under what you have called me to submit to. And God has given us a promise in his word where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You've been called to be free, brethren, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh, but rather serve one another in love, Galatians 5.13. God has given us such a freedom in Christ once we choose to give up our lives that he will give us such a grace and an empowerment to walk out what he's called us to live out. It's not always easy. It's not always the most fun thing to do, but it's the most fulfilling and rewarding thing that you can possibly do. In a world of self-help, self-improvement, self-development, self preservation, self-development. God has told us to deny self and that's where true freedom is found. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24 through 26, if you do not first deny yourself and pick up your cross daily, you can't be my disciple. Whoever finds his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it if a man gains the whole world yet loses his soul? What can you give up this week? What can you do this week to look more like Jesus and not be living in the deception of the lies around us? Find something actionably to do from this video and actually live that thing out because of it. Amen? If you would, click the link wherever it is around this video and subscribe for more.